born on July 8th, 1903, died May 30th, 1981, Gwendolyn Bennett was an American artist, writer, and journalist who contributed to an opportunity, a journal of Negro life, which chronicled the cultural advancements during the Harlem Renaissance. Very often, Gwendolyn is overlooked. She herself made considerable accomplishments in poetry and prose. She is best known, perhaps, for the short story Wedding Day, which was published in the first issue of Fire. Gwendolyn was a dedicated and self-preserving woman, respectfully known as being a strong influence of African-American women's rights during the Harlem Renaissance. Throughout her dedication and perseverance, Gwendolyn raised the bar when it came to women's literature, education, and one of her contributions to the Harlem Renaissance was her literary acclaimed short story, Poets Evening, which helped the understanding within the African American communities, resulting in many African Americans coming to terms with identifying and accepting themselves. Today, I'm going to be reading and celebrating the story, The Wedding Day, from Gwendolyn Bennett. Enjoy. Wedding Day. His name was Paul Watson, and as he shammed down Rue Piguet, he might have been any other Negro of enormous height and size. But as I've said, his name was Paul Watson. Passing him on the street, you might not have known or cared who he was, but any one of the residents around the great Montreux district of Paris could have told you who he was as well as many of the interesting bits of his personal history. He had come to Paris in the days before the colored jazz bands were the style. Back home, he had been a prize fighter. In the days when Joe Gantz was in his glory, Paul was following the ring too. He didn't have that fine way about him that Gantz had, and for that reason, luck seemed to always go against him. When he was in the ring, he was like a mad bull especially if his opponent was a white man. In those days, there wasn't any sympathy or nicety about the ring, and so pretty soon all the ringmasters got down on Paul, and he found it pretty hard to get about with anyone. Then, he worked, then it was that he worked his way across the Atlantic Ocean on a big liner in the days before colored jazz bands were the style in Paris. Things smo flowed smoothly. Things flowed along smoothly for the first few years with Paul working here and there in the unfrequented places of Paris. On the side, he used to give boxing lessons to aspiring youths or just gymnastic young women. At the time, he was working so steadily that he had little chance to find out what was going on around Paris. Pretty soon, however, he grew to know among the trainers and managers and began to fix up bouts for him. After one or two successful bouts, a little fame began to come into being for him. So it was that after one of those prize fights, a colored fella came into his dressing room to congratulate him on his success, as well as invite him to go to the Montmartre to meet the boys. Paul had a way about him, and it seemed to get on with the colored fellows who worked in the Montmartre, and when the first Negro jazz plan paid, played in a tall, tiny Parisian cafe, Paul was among them playing the banjo. Those first years were without event so far as Paul was concerned. The members of that first band often say now that they wonder how it was that nothing happened during those first seven years, for it was generally known how great Paul's hatred for American white people. I suppose the tranquility in the light of what happened afterwards 
was due in fact that the care in which they worked was one in which most French people drank and danced. And then too, that there was, before there were so many Americans visiting Paris. However, everyone had heard Paul speak of his intense hatred of American white folks. It only took two two uh, benedictions to make him start talking about what he would do to the first yank that called him nigger. But seven years came to an end and Paul Watson went to work in a larger cafe with a larger band patronized almost solely by Americans. I've heard almost every Negro in Monterey tell about the night that a drunken Kentuckian came into the cafe where Paul was playing and said, Look here, brother. What you all doing over here? None of your business, and look here. I ain't your brother, see? Jack, do you hear that nigger talking like that to me? And as he said this, he turned to speak to his companion. I have often wished that I had been there to have seen the thing that happened myself. Every tale I heard about it was different, and yet there was something of truth in each of them. Perhaps the nearest one can come to the truth is by saying that Paul beat up that full, beat up four full-sized white men that night doing a great deal of damage to the furniture about the cafe. I couldn't tell you just what happened. Some of the fellas said that Paul seized the nearest table and mowed down men right and left. Another said he took a bottle. And then again, the story runs that a chair was the instrument of his fury. At any rate, that started Paul Watson on his siege against American white people who brings his native prejudices into the life of Paris. It is the verity that Paul was the black terror, the last symbol of the word nigger, never passed the lips of a white man without the quick reflex action of Paul's arm and fist to the speaker's jaw. He paid more for glassware and cafe furnishings in the course of the next few years than is easily imaginable. And yet there was something likable about Paul. Perhaps that's the reason that he stood in so well with the policemen of the neighborhood. Always some divine power seemed to intervene in his behalf, and he was excused after the payment of a small fine with the advice about his future conduct. Finally, there came that night when in a frenzy he shot two American sailors. They had not died from the wounds he had given them, hence his sentence had not been one of death, but rather a long term of imprisonment. It was a pitiful sight to see Paul sitting in the corner of his cell with his great body hunched almost double. He seldom talked, and when he did, his words were interspersed with lows and oaths about the lowness of crackers. Then the World War came. It seems strange that anyone, anything so horrible as the wholesale slaughter could bring about any good, and yet there was something of a smoothing quality about even its baseness. There was, there had never been such an equality before and since such as, as that which the World War brought. Rich men fought by the sides of paupers. Poets swapped yarns with dry goods salesmen. My Jews and Christians ate corned beef out of the same tin. Along with the general leveling influence came France's pardon of her prisoners in order that they might enter the war. Paul became a freak, became free and a French soldier. Because he was strong and having an innate daring in his heart, he was placed in an aerial squad and cited many times for bravery. The close of the war gave him his place in France and French society as a hero. With only a memory of the war and an ugly scar on his left cheek, he took up his old life. Rube Cow in the early evening had a 
sombre beauty gray, as are most Paris streets and other worldish. To those who know the district, it is the Harlem of Paris and the Rue Piget and its dusky 7th Avenue. Most of the colored musicians that furnish Parisians and their visitors with entertainment live somewhere in the neighborhood of Rue Piget. Someday, sometime during every day, each of these musicians make a point of passing through Rouge Pizze. Little wonder that almost any day you'll find Paul Watson going his shuffling way up the same street. He reached the corner of Rue de la Bruyere, and with the short instinct, his feet stopped. Without half thinking, he turned into the pit. His full name is the Flea Pit. And if you'd ask one of the musicians why it was so called, he would answer you to the fact that it was called the pit because all the fleas hang out there. If you did not get the full input of this explanation, he would not go further and say that there were always spades in the pit and they were always thick as fleas. Unless you could understand this latter attempt at clarity, you could not fully grasp what the flea pet meant to Negro musicians in Monterey. It is a tiny cafe of genius that is called a bistro in France. Here the fiddle players, saxophone blowers, drum beaters, and ivory ticklers gather at four in the afternoon for a porter or a game of billiards. Here the cabaret entertainment entertainers and supper, supper, supper musicians meet at one o'clock at, at night and thereafter for whiskey and soda or more billiards. Occasional sandwiches and a quiet game also play their part in the popularity of the place. After a season or two, it becomes a settled fact just what time you may catch so-and-so at the famous pit. The musicians are very, very fond of Paul and took a particular delight in teasing him. He was one of the chosen few that all of the musicians considered as being regular. It was the pet joke of the habitat of the cafe that Paul never bought it with girls. They always said that he could beat up ten men but was scared to death of one woman. Say, fella, when you going to get, a hook, get hooked up? Can't say, Bo. Ain't much on skirts. Man alive, you don't know what you're missing. Somebody a little cute and telling you sweet things in your ear. Paris is full of women folks. I ain't much on them on them the same. Then too, they're all white. What is it to you? This ain't America. Can't help that. Get this uh I I I I I'm clued, I guess. I ain't got nothing for white meat to do. If a woman even called me a nigga, I'd have to kill her. That's all. For, for, for it, son, I can't give you a thing on this Mr. Jefferson Lord way of looking at women. Oh, taint that. I guess they're all right for those that want some. Not me. Oh, you ain't so 40. You'll fall like all the other spades I've met. Your kind finder kind of falls the hardest. When Paul made his way alone, he smoked and drank with the fellas and sat for hours at the Monterey cafes and never knew the companionship of a woman. Then one night after his work, he was walking along the streets in a queer, shuffling way when a woman stepped up to his side. Voulez-vous? No, go, no, go away from here. Oh, you speak English, don't you? You an American woman? I used to be before I went to, went on the stage and got stranded over here. Mm. Well, get away from here. I don't like your kind. Oh, buddy, don't say that. I ain't prejudiced like some fool woman. You don't know who I am, do you? I'm Paul Watson, and I hate American white folks, see? He pushed her aside and went walking alone. He hadn't gone far when she caught up to him and said with sad, said with sobs in her voice, Oh, Lordy, please don't hate me because I was born white and, and an American. I ain't got a, 
uh, a soul to my name, and all all the men pass me by because I ain't spruced up. Now you come along and, and you won't even look at me because I'm white. Paul strode along with her clinging to her arm. He tried to shake her off several times, but there was no use. She clung all the more desperately to him. He looked down at her frail body shaking with sobs and something caught at his heart before he knew what he was doing. He said, no, I ain't that mean. I'll get you some grub. Quit your crying. Don't like seeing women folk cry. It was a talk of Montreal. Paul Watson takes a woman to Javanese every night for dinner. He comes to the flea pit less frequently, thus giving the other musicians plenty of opportunity to discuss him. How times change, do change, Paul. The woman ate up as a Jane now. You ain't said nothing, fella. That ain't all. She's white and American, too. That's, excuse me, that's the way she's white and American, too. You, st oh, here we go, sorry. That's the way it is with these spades. They beat up all the white men they can lay their hands on, but as soon as a gang of golden hair with blue eyes rubs them close, on, close to them, they forget all they have to say about hating white folk. Guess he thinks the skirt's going on him too. Hmm, dumb fool. Don't be no chinaman. That old gag don't fit for Paul. He can't understand it no more than we can. Says he just can't help himself every time she looks up into his eyes and asks him, does he love her? They sure are happy together. Paul's going to marry her, too. At first, she kept saying that she didn't want to get married because she wasn't married. She wasn't the marrying kind and all that talk. But Paul just laid down the law to her and told her he never would live with no woman without being married to her. Then he began to tell him all about her past life. He told her that he didn't care about what she used to be just so as long as they loved each other now. Guess they'll make it. Yeah, Paul told me the same tale last night. He's sure gone and they're all right. She, they're getting tied up next Sunday. So glad it's not me. Don't trust those American dames. Not me. Me's for the Frenchies. She ain't no worse for looks, bud. Now that she's been furnishing the green for the rags. Now that he's been furnishing the greens for the rags. Yeah, but I don't see no reason for wedding bells. She was right. She ain't the marrying kind. So Montaire talked at every cafe where the Negro musicians congregated. Paul Watson was the topic for conversation. He had suddenly fallen from his place as bronze god to almost less than the dust. The morning sun made queer patterns on Paul's sleeping face. He grimaced several times and slumbered and finally half opened his eyes. After a succession of dream-laden blinks, he gave a great yawn and rubbing his eyes, he looked at the open window through which the sun shone brightly. His first conscious thought was that this was the bride's day and that the bright sunshine prophesied happiness for the bride throughout her married life. His first impulse was to settle back into the covers and think drowsily about uh, Mary and the queer twist life brings about, as if the wand of most bridegrooms on their last morning of bachelorhood. He put this impulse aside in favor of dressing quickly and rushing downstairs to telephone to Mary and to say, Happy wedding day to her. One huge foot slipped into a worn bedroom slipper and then the other painfully out of the warm bed were the courageous beginnings of his bridal toilet. With the look of triumph, he put on his new great suit they had ordered from an English tailor. He carefully poured the taffeta tie into place beneath his chin, noting as he looked at his face in the mirror that the seer he had received in the army was very ugly funny, marrying an ugly man like him. French telephones are such human faults. After trying for about 15 minutes to get 
Central 3201. He decided he might as well walk around the Mary's Hotel to give his greeting as to stand there in his lobby of his own, wasting his time. He debated this in his mind a great deal. They were to be married at four o'clock. It's 11 now, and it, it did seem a shame not to let her have a minute or two by herself. As it be, he went walking down the street towards her hotel. He laughed to think of how one always congregates over doing something and finally does the thing he wanted to in the beginning anyway. Mud on his nice gray suit that English tailor had made for him. Damn gray suit. Why did he have to have a gray suit on for anyway? Folks with black folks faces shouldn't wear gray suits, God. But it was funny that time when he beat that cracker at the pyramid. Folks couldn't shut his mouth. He was so surprised. Crackers, damn him. He was one he was he was the one nigga that wasn't afraid of him. Wouldn't he have a hell of a time if he went back to America where black was black? Wasn't white nowhere, black wasn't. What was the thought he was trying to get a hold of bumping around in his head? Something he started to think about but couldn't remember it somehow. The sheer old whistle that is typical of a French subway pierced in its way into his thoughts. Subway, why was he in the subway? He didn't want to go any place. He heard doors slamming and, and saw blue uniforms of the conductors swinging onto the cars as the train began to pull out of the station. With one or two strides, he reached to the last coach as it began to move up the platform. A bit out of breath, he stood inside the train and looking down at what he had in his hand, he saw that it was a tiny pink ticket, a first class ticket and a second-class coach. The idea set him to laughing. Everyone in the car turned and eyed him, but that, but that did not bother him. Wonder what stop he'd get off. Funny how these French had to send when, when they mean off funny, they couldn't, they, they couldn't pick up French. Been here so long, first-class ticket and a second-class coach. That was the one on him. Wedding day today and that damn letter for Mary. How she said now, just couldn't go through with it. White women just don't marry colored men. And she was a street woman too. Why couldn't she have just told him flat that she just wasn't getting back on her feet at his expense? Funny, that first class ticket he brought. Wish he could see Mary, him a going there to wish her Happy wedding day, too. Wonder what that French woman was looking at him so hard for. Guess it was the mud. And that is the wedding day. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Gwendolyn B. Bennett wrote during the time of the Harlem Renaissance. And the wedding day, a short story, is one of her most famous pieces.